Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Macmillan Center. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you here. I'm Ian Shapiro, currently the director, and I'm just delighted to be able to host Mo Ibrahim as the speaker for the Coca-Cola World Fund Lecture at Yale. The lecture was established in 1992 by the late Roberto Guazzera, former chair and CEO of Coca-Cola Company and a 1953 alumnus of Yale College. The Macmillan Center sponsors the event along with the law school and SOM. Dr. Ibrahim is the founder of Celtel International, Africa's lead leading mo mobile telephone company. In 2006, he created the Mo Ibrahim Foundation to improve the quality of governance in Africa. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Ibrahim in Index um, of Governance, which provides civil society and governments with comprehensive and quantifiable tools to assess governments and to promote accountability. The Ibrahim Prize for Achievement in African Leadership recognizes and celebrates excellence. Dr. Ibrahim is also the founding chairman of Satya Capital Limited, an investment fund focused on Africa. Uh, listed by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, Mo Ibrahim has received numerous honorary degrees and other awards from a range of academic institutions, but I just learned this afternoon that this is his first visit to Yale, so we're really delighted to, uh, to, to have him here. He's also the recipient of many awards, including the Chairman's Award for Lifetime Achievement from the GSM Foundation in 2007, the Economist Innovation Award in 2007 for Social and Economic Innovation, and the BNP Paribas Prize for Philanthropy in 2008. Um, Mo Ibrahim is going to be speaking for about 50 minutes or so, and um, we will have plenty of time for questions and uh, discussion thereafter, hoping to finish at about 5.30. I, I would just say now that at the conclusion of these proceedings, there'll be a reception on the second floor where you'll be able to um, meet and talk further with, with our speaker. But I I'll, I'll would request that you not come down here uh, because otherwise he'll never make it to the reception. <laughs> so uh, at the conclusion of our proceedings, go on up to the second floor and we'll meet you here. The title that Mo Ibrahim has chosen for his lecture is Governance, Leadership, Civil Society, and the Private Sector, an African Prospectus, uh, Perspective. I'm pleased to introduce Mo Ibrahim. Thank you very much, Ian, and uh, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to come to this wonderful university to uh, speak to faculty and students. Uh, it's a great uh, opportunity. I'm really going to have a conversation with you about uh, our perspective on the issues of governance and leadership and uh, private sector, etc. Let me start by, by, by just stating that contrary to the perception, Africa is not poor. Africa is a very rich continent. It's the second largest continent on Earth. We have more than our share of natural resources. And actually, there's not many African people. We are about one billion. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I do apologize. Okay. <laughs> let me. When you're ready for the video, let me know. Okay. Uh, let me start uh, again. I'm just trying to say that Africa is is rich. It's a rich continent, and uh, it's a huge continent. This is uh, all African people are just one billion people which is far less than India or China or uh, uh, 
uh, uh, who occupy much, much less space than us and uh, lack a lot of our resources. So uh, we have a rich continent, uh, but we have also poor people. And this, this is the issue. Why rich continent and poor people? Uh, most African countries gained their independence uh, around 50 years ago or so. At that time, the income per head in many African countries, like Ghana, like Egypt, like Sudan, was actually higher. The income per head in China or in India, in South Korea, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in all these places. And uh, what happened then over 50 years that uh, uh, result in African uh, uh, countries and African people really walk backward? I cannot find any answer to that question other than we suffered a major failure in governance and leadership. There's no other reason. And that is a big elephant in the room which we really need to uh, uh, focus on it and to see why uh, this happened in Africa. And uh, uh, because we, we cannot dance around that issue. Uh, people blame colonialism. I think actually what happened during the Cold War maybe were even uh, worse than colonialism in that the two superpowers uh, adopted client states and uh, it doesn't matter what those leaders and uh, in this client state did what matters is that they are our bastards as the american famous statement by the american ambassador uh, to Congo, uh, when he was arguing why the World Bank should continue to extend loans to Mobutu, uh, which never reached the Treasury. Uh, but he's our bastard. In the fight for mineral resources, uh, for strategic uh, positioning, it did governance didn't matter at all. And uh, there's no coincidence that things start to improve in Africa actually uh, since the end of the Cold War. Because this excuse uh, for supporting uh, terrible uh, uh, dictators and thieves in Africa have actually ceased. There's no, no justification to support any bastard. And I apologize for using the word, but that is the word used uh, 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 by our American friend. Uh, now, the, the, but what, what is governance? Governance really is about the delivery of public goods from security, safety, uh, 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 to economic opportunity, human development, human rights, peaceful transfer of power, and building of institutions. These are the things people expect from their governments. And as such, these are measurable. And what we needed now is to really create a scorecard to really measure all these deliverables. And uh, that one reason behind us uh, starting our <coughs> project on uh, the African Index of Governance. We produce the African index of governance as a, an objective scientific measurement of delivery <coughs> every year. We measure about 88 parameters, uh, which cover all these elements of governance as a scorecard to see exactly what each uh, government has delivered to its people over that years. How many school seats, how many kilometers of roads, uh, clean water, uh, 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 what is the situation of women? We have eight indicators uh, to try to measure women's social 
economic and political rights, uh, the economic opportunities, uh, uh, management of public finance, uh, human rights, participation, which in our view is, is, is a better word than democracy, which is very much abused. Uh, many people assume that uh, having a peaceful election uh, means you have a democratic society. Uh, that's not necessarily just the, the, the case. It, it all depends on what happens before the election. Will people have the right to campaign, the right to assemble? Uh, they have access to media. Uh, what about the electoral registry? Is it clean? Uh, all these things are measurements. That's why I really hate it every time we we'll have an election and then we end up with those gentlemen usually appearing on television and say, oh, it's a good election because it is peaceful. I mean, we all know in Sudan, for example, my country, the last presidential election in the north, the result was decided well before the election because there was at least three or four million bogus names, dead people or people who never existed. I see a Sudanese colleague here smiling. She knows that. Yet, uh, President Carter stood and said, well, it was peaceful. Nobody was beaten up. There's no need because the election was stolen before it even started. Anyway, so that's what I'm talking about as uh, 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 participation. <laughs> and it's really uh, 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 important for us uh, to, to change the narrative. Uh, first thing any president does when elected is he got themselves a good speech writer. I don't know if uh, Ernesto did the same or... Uh, I wrote my own speech. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> You're not African, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what we need is really to... to, 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 to to say, look, I mean, it's not about writing good speech or uh, good manifest. So what we need is, is, is the food on the table? What exactly have you delivered? Uh, we need to measure that, and that we need to change the conversation from slogans and, and, and uh, uh, all this uh, prose and poetry uh, into real uh, uh, achievements and deliverable for the people. So that really was the, uh, our objective in, in producing uh, uh, the index. Governance and leaderships are important. Leadership matters, it matters for all of us because there's always a need to take these long-term tough decisions uh, which increasingly politicians shy away from. And this is not an African phenomenon, I also think, look around in Europe and the United States and you see why, how people are dodging uh, tough decisions. Uh, look at the issue of climate, for example. Uh, we are jeopardizing the future of our children by not acting because we're refusing to accept a little pain now and we don't care about what severe pain will be inflicted on our children and grandchildren. And uh, that's where actually we lack leadership, where people are able to stand up and make this tough uh, uh, tough, tough decisions. Uh, leadership matters in Africa even more. For a simple reason, we, in emerging democracies, uh, we don't have the checks and balances which exist in a mature democracy. Uh, you have the various pillars of power, whether it is parliaments or Congress in your case, or uh, uh, you have the, 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 the courts, you have the uh, media, of course. And there is some kind of equilibrium uh, is created here and checks and balances. In an emerging democracy, uh, these institutions are all weak, unfortunately. And you found that the power of the president, uh, the leader of the country, is, is too big, it's too much. Uh, of course, you have the opposite here. Maybe you have a president in the White House who cannot even pass a law to limit, uh, do some checks on gun control or whatever. This is the other side of the coin where you have too much balance and equilibrium and then you end up with, 
no, <laughs> no decisions. Uh, so what we need is a healthy equilibrium. But leaderships do, do matter. And we always ask uh, the questions. You take a president like uh, Shishano in Mozambique. Uh, he came to power, and the country was in the middle of civil war. Renam was a very vicious uh, uh, armed group, and uh, there was no end to the fighting. Where the country was going to go? So he campaigned hard to convince his own party and his own population that we need to make peace with Renamo. We need to invite them to participate in the democratic process. Let's liberalize the economy, end one-party rule, and uh, end civil war. And that saved the lives of millions of people. What would have happened if President Bashir in Sudan followed that example? would have saved 300,000 lives in Sudan, and how many people are killed right now in South Kordofan and elsewhere. These are the kind of decisions uh, people can make and can save lives. That's really important. And this is the issue of, 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 of leadership. And that's why we decided to introduce this prize for leadership in Africa uh, to really celebrate the leaders who come forward and make change, really change the dynamics in their country, take millions of people out of poverty, and, 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 and these are heroes, and we need to recognize those heroes. Africa, unfortunately, has always had a bad press. The perception of Africa always is that of uh, uh, a sick, continent ruled by military or, or crazy people. Uh, when you ask people what do you think of Africa, people immediately think of uh, refugee camps and uh, feeble, starving children. Uh, what is the images people have in their mind when you mention the word Africa? It's not healthy. And sometimes it goes against the grain because, you know, <sighs> African people are very healthy. Uh, they, are, they are not sick or, or, you know, it's true. I mean, if you watch the Olympics last year in London, <laughs> you know, African guys, uh, you know, won everything. <laughs> we, we run faster than anybody. We jump higher. We, we you know, we, we, we play better, better football. We, we really, uh, uh, without African players, there will be no football in Europe. This is not a joke. This is true. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I was I was in South Africa during the 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 the, the World Cup a few years ago, and South Africa was playing France. And as an African and a guest in South Africa, I thought it's my duty to support uh, South African team. And I had a problem because I couldn't know. I, did, I couldn't really find out which team was <laughs> South Africa, which is, because they're all black guys. <laughs> and really, there's like eight players out of 11 in the French team who are black. Same number like in the South African team. So I said, who's the African team here? <laughs> and so th this is Africa. Why, 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 why we have that uh, 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 false impression uh, about Africans, I think we need to correct that. And uh, I always had arguments with my friends in Save the Children Fund and Oxfam, and in raising funds, always in Christmas, they bring all these terrible pictures of starving kids and, 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 and mothers in, uh, you know, because they need to raise funds. And I always tell them, you guys, you are really producing a bad picture uh, uh, about Africa, which is not really helpful. So we have some differences, uh, uh, differences there. Now, Africa is rising. The last 10 years, we have seen a continuous progress in, in, in the economic fortunes of Africa. Uh, we do are developing at the rate of about 5% over the last five years, which are 
It's not a fantastic number. It's not as high as China. But at least it's much better than uh, 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 most of the world, actually. That is, that is really interesting. And uh, I think uh, that is sustainable, uh, provided we watch out for a number of things. One thing worries me uh, about the rise in the African economic fortunes is the issue of inequalities. If, if the rewards of economic development is not seen uh, to be inclusive, we have a problem. And uh, the problem was uh, uh, when we call, uh, we quote number, you know, GDP per head, they can hide uh, uh, a lot of inequality and we need to have uh, a better way to, re to really measure that. Uh, that, that really worries me, the, the rising inequality, and because that undermines the, the issue of, 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 of sustainability of in, in our economic fortunes. Uh, the rise in African uh, fortunes also is underpinned by the civil society in Africa. And that's the major difference. We had a number of false dawns before, where it, where it appeared that Africa is about to wake up and to move only for us to stutter and uh, to fall back. This time is different because there is a very thriving civil society rising in, in Africa today. And uh, I will focus really on two groups uh, who are crucial uh, for Africa's future, young people and women. These are the two amazing forces rising now in Africa. Let's take, talk about youth, African youth. I don't know if you are aware that 50% of Africans are below 19 and a half years old. Huge bulge of young people uh, in Africa. The demography in Africa is in the invert, complete inverted from the demographics in Europe or in Japan or in China uh, uh, or elsewhere, except the Middle East. Uh, that is a very interesting uh, 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 development because in a world we have shrinking young people, where the workforce is going to come, who is going to support all those aging people? We have an aging population everywhere, actually. Uh, how those guys will be supported? Who's going to uh, really pay their bills? That's an issue. Uh, Africa offers a solution. But that solution is dependent on what we're going to do with our young people. What kind of education, what kind of training we're offering to our young people. That is the most urgent challenge we're facing now. What we're going to do with our young people. If we fail, we're going to have a major problem. Tunis, or Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, whatever, these were all revolts by young people, actually. Uh, and we're going to see more uh, 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 upheavals in the region if we fail to do that. We're going to see more makeshift boats carrying young people sinking in the middle Mediterranean trying to reach Europe, which is something we really need to avoid. So the education and training of our young people is very important. And uh, I was mentioning to Ian early on that one of the strange statistics we're looking at, it says in Africa, if you are more educated, you have less chance of getting a job. And that's a very strange uh, statement. And it raises the question of what exactly are we teaching and training our young people? Uh, are we completely disconnected from the business, from life, from job market, or what? Who is drawing our curriculum? Who is, who is, who is, who is designing our training programs, etc.? Is the business Are the business people involved in that? or is it done by, just by a bunch of bureaucrats 
the Ministry of Education who have no clue uh, what the work market uh, is about. So that is a real challenge we need to uh, put our finger on. Women, women are very important, especially in Africa, because 70% of the African people live in rural areas based on agriculture. Agriculture is the main economy in Africa. It involves 70% of the population. Who is doing agriculture in Africa is women. Men don't do agriculture. No African men do agriculture. It's women. So women do the agriculture. Women do homes. Women take kids to schools. Women work with the kids. Then they cook, and then they do whatever. And uh, I'm not sure what exactly men do in Africa, <laughs> but But it is, it, is, it is very interesting that to the, the economy of Africa really is dependent on women. And yet, they don't have access to finance. They are not supported. Uh, it's almost impossible uh, for women and agriculture to get right seeds, to get fertilizers. They cannot raise funds. And one of the problem here is, is, is the land issue. Because most African government sits on the land. They don't give the title to the, uh, 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 to the women. So women cannot monetize their holdings. They are sitting in, in, in a decent piece of land, but they cannot go to the bank to borrow some money to buy some seeds because they have no security. So that is a major issue. And uh, it's something we are arguing and campaigning for with the African government, really, to, 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 to help solve this, uh, uh, this issue of how we modernize our agriculture, which is extremely uh, promising. This one area of activities where everybody eats, you know, and we have, in general, rising population, or s you know, 7 billion people, maybe rising to 8 billion people shrinking resources, people eat more meat, Chinese discovered meat, and God help us, because meat takes a huge amount of resources uh, 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 to produce a kilogram of meat. Uh, where is this gonna come from? So we think agriculture is not backward. Agriculture can be a really a decent growth area uh, for our economies if it's done properly and if we are committed more resources there. Uh, we are really upset because the African leaders in Mabutu in uh, about 10 years ago, they committed that 10% of the budget at least of every African country, budget of every African country, 10% at least will be devoted to uh, agriculture which is a reasonable sum, given that 70% of your economy. And last time I checked, there were only about seven or eight countries who fulfilled that. So I asked the question, when a child starves, who is responsible? That is a question we ask our leaders. Who is responsible when our people die? Because you guys refused to honor your commitment to really fund our farmers. So that, that's an issue uh, we, we, we are really fighting and, and we think it's a very important issue. We need to raise it, et cetera. On the political front, uh, the other big elephant in the room, which we, 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 we're all concerned about, is that of the need for the economic integration of Africa. We have, a, we have a problem because everybody talks about Africa. Africa this, Africa that, Africa. I remember when I was running my company, an American investor called me one day and said, oh, Mo, where are you? Uh, I'm gonna go to Africa, uh, you know, <laughs> next week. Can we have dinner? <laughs> and it's true, I swear it's true story. And I say, <laughs> Africa is a continent. <laughs> And uh, 
So sometimes we lapse into talking about Africa as if it is a country. Africa is 54 countries. And that's one big problem for us. Not only are 54 countries, but we are 44 countries who refuse to trade with each other, refuse to communicate with each other. And you ask, how are we gonna produce scale here? How can, how can industry develop here? How any, any acti economic activity can develop here if we have 54 subscale countries and you don't have the freedom of movement for goods, for capital, for people? There's no future. In this world today, you know, if Germany thinks it's very important to be in the European Union, even though they have to go and bail Greece and Cyprus and God knows whom, uh, because there is tangible economic benefit of creating these wide trade areas. Trucks move from Frankfurt to Glasgow, nobody stop it. Ger you know, German goods move around, vegetables move around, and that you need that. People move around, capital move around. The economy of Germany is 2.4 times that of Africa. And if Africa, if Germany thinks that is important for its prosperity to remain in that European Union, how come we 54 little countries insist that we have our own customs, our own rules, our own sacred borders, and we refuse to deal with each other? It's, it's a major problem. We need to be able, do you imagine what is the consequence of this? Tomatoes rot in this country and you have a famine in this country next door. How, ca how, can, you, how, how can you deal with this? i give you an example from my own industry, mobile communications. Uh, early on, before I start my company, I was working for British Telecom. I was techni technical director of the first seller operation. And when we procured our system, we procured actually for Motorola here, and we insisted in the contract that Motorola will build <coughs> production lines in UK to make base stations and to make handsets, etc. And they did. <coughs> our first customers were, uh, I mean, like 100,000 customers or whatever. In Africa today, we have 500 mobile users, <coughs> 500 million mobile users. That's bigger than the number of subscribers here in US or in Europe. We don't have a single factory in, 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 in Africa producing base stations or mobiles. Why? Simply because we are 54 countries and each country have three or four operators and each one negotiates their own contracts separately. They don't have the power to ask the manufacturers that you need to build your, 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 your production line here. That's why we end up being consumers instead of being producers. It's very sad. Look at China. Nobody, nobody can do any business in China without transferring know-how, without putting investment, without putting manufacturing, and end up in a few years later, the Chinese producing the goods and selling back to you actually here. But that is the power of scale. If you don't have the scale, you cannot sit at the table, you don't have any negotiating uh, power. That is the importance of economic integration for Africa to be able really to build the scale uh, 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 which enable us uh, uh, to, to really deal with the outside world. So that's uh, one of the very important uh, uh, agendas for us uh, in Africa. I'm gonna take uh, uh, a short brief here. I'm gonna show you uh, a video about the foundation, what exactly we're trying to do, and then I'll continue uh, to address really the issue of the private sector, which I think is a very important uh, issue.
as important as ensuring the quality of governance and good leadership in Africa. An African leader is faced with major challenges. How to take his people out of poverty, how to deal with issues of educating many young people, sorting out conflicts, dealing with health issues, water, electricity. Their success is crucial. It's crucial for the lives of millions of people in Africa. We need a leadership that will create a bond between those who lead and the people who have given their trust in elections. Leadership is important everywhere, but especially so in Africa. The tasks facing leaders in Africa are challenging, and the lives and well-beings of many millions of people depend upon the performance of those leaders. It follows that we should strive to recognize and reward those successful leaders who are able to deliver tangible results for their citizens. Our African continent is rich in the diversity of its people. It is rich in its resources and it is rich in its potential. Our continent is beginning to fulfill this promise. I am Mo Ibrahim. I am a Nubian from Sudan, so I am an African. I am a businessman who was involved in uh, building telecom infrastructure in Africa through Celtel, uh, which is a success story. I think we prove the point that people can do clean business in Africa, help create jobs, create prosperity, build infrastructure, and uh, also can be profitable. Good governance and democracy are central to Africa's development. Without them, it will be hard, if not impossible, for any African countries to reach the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. And that is why the mission of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation is so important. Thanks to Mo's vision, the Foundation can contribute to the growing movement to build honest and enlightened African leadership. Mo Ibrahim has established the Mo Ibrahim Foundation to develop criteria for good governance, stimulate a public debate, and challenge the continent's leaders to set the global benchmark on this issue. We really want to support the African leadership and we want to reward achievement. We want to celebrate success of African leadership. We are going to offer the largest prize in history, the largest prize in the world for those successful leaders who manage really to take these people forward. Nothing is more important than that. And the important thing here is that we are African, and uh, this is an African foundation, it's an African money. This is Africa doing its own business. And it's time for us to really look back into Africa and do something ourselves. We cannot just sit there and expect the world to come and do things for us. And uh, so it is in that context, we are launching really our foundation. It's wonderful that somebody of the caliber of Mo Ibrahim a successful businessman, feels so strongly about Africa and about leadership in Africa. I wish the Foundation much success in its important work, and I thank Mo Ibrahim for the leadership that he is demonstrating, the prize for which will be one we can all share, a better and brighter future. May your initiative inspire and celebrate the best of African leadership and equip future leaders with the knowledge and experience they will need. Malice in a way,
Ninguém que o ama laica Yeba The index is an attempt by our foundation to measure and quantify the elements of that basket of political goods each government needs to deliver to its citizens. We're not talking about political programs, about intentions, good or bad, or uh, party manifestos. We're talking about a measure of what is being achieved on the ground. That is the index. And it is really wonderful to see so many friends around here today. It warms my heart. We are proud to be the Foundation's Honorary Laureate and we accept it on behalf of all of those across the continent. I wish at the outset to express my sincere and profound thanks to the Prize Committee of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation for awarding me the first Mo Ibrahim Prize for achievement in African leadership. I am honored and humbled by the bestowal upon me of such a prestigious award. The Prize Committee believes that President Pedro Verona Pires is a worthy winner of the 2011 Ibrahim Prize for Achievement in African Leadership. <laughs> Hello, hello, 
ladies and gentlemen, I think you had too much fun. It's time to do some work. You got to talk to someone someday. Cause when the words are gone, it's too late. You got to talk to someone someday. Cause when the words are gone, it's too late. Communication. I think I had a flavor of the way uh, we work, what, what is the main uh, 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 work of the foundation. And maybe you notice there's also a lot of music and uh, informality about what we do. That's very important because governance doesn't need to be boring. <laughs> and uh, the events are carried live by satellite, actually, at least 30 countries. Uh, uh, Puts that out live at at, uh, at peak peak hour seven o'clock in the evening, and we want young people to watch and listen what's going on in these meetings, and uh, this is some of the best music in Africa. We think music and art is is an integral part of our work uh, to really galvanize and attract young people to uh, our work. Uh, now I need to say a couple of things really about the role and the issue of the private sector. Let me start by saying that private sector is essential for our prosperity and our growth. Private sector business is about creating jobs, creating wealth. That will be the engine which moves, moves Africa forward. And uh, uh, last year, a friend, a good friend of mine actually, uh, was we're having dinner and he he, he turned to me and said, you know what? You know, I was just coming from a trip, we're going to another trip, and we, I said, you know, Mo, you are running around doing so much at your old age. And, but you know what? I think really sell till our mobile investment of operations in Africa really did more to develop, take Africa forward than all this running about you're doing in the foundation. And I thought about it and said, yeah, Maybe, maybe that's correct. It's created so many jobs, boosted the GDP forward, connected Africa. That's, that's, that's wonderful. That's the power of business, actually. So uh, it's really important to spend a little bit of time talking about business and Africa here. Uh, having conceded the important role of the business people and the business in Africa, I think we need to also talk about few things here. Business people are at the forefront uh, when we come and talk about corruption and governance. And uh, they always demand the right climate for investment, how it's important. And we give presidents hell uh, when we see they are really impeding investment by whatever nonsense they are doing. Uh, but I think it's only fair to really ask business people to <laughs> live up to the same standards they are asking of public officials. Let me start by saying here, for every corrupt official, there's at least 12 or more corrupt business people, correct? Politicians don't bribe themselves. <laughs> that is not a good idea, I guess. So who, who's the other party? This is a crime committed by at least two consenting adults. So who's the other party? It's really time to raise this, this sort of question. And it's only legitimate that in the same breath as we are asking for good governance from our leaders and our officials to ask 
for good corporate governance also from business. Because it's impossible for us to achieve good governance in public life unless we had good corporate governance also. That is very important. And it's time to have a serious conversation about this. Because that is a subject which people don't talk about uh, much, unfortunately. So, I, <laughs> in Europe, I mean, I, I just, I ought to mention Europe here because sometimes we, we, we feel really exasperated about European attitudes to corruption. Uh, United States actually uh, played a very important role in the fight against corruption and the Basel Corruption Act, I think, in 30 years ago or, or more. But what's more important is they acted. Every week or other week, you hear about a case. They take people to court, they find companies, they act. Europe did not introduce laws against corruptions until the year 2000. Until the year 2000, it was absolutely legal to corrupt any official anywhere. Not only it is legal, it is also tax deductible. <laughs> it was called business expenses. Can you believe that? Year 2000. Under pressure from the OCED, European countries introduced laws against corruptions. And 10 years later, we ask how many prosecutions took place in Europe. So all our friends, all those leader politicians in, in, in Europe, when they stand on the soapbox and lecture us about corruption, we ask them, are you really serious guys or is it a joke? How can you have a corrupt leader in Africa without having corrupt leaders in France or in UK or in Germany? You guys did not prosecute anybody. So you are saying they are corrupt free. So what are you talking about? The Americans are, are prosecuting people. And Europeans say, no, we, we don't have corrupt business people here. So then we don't have corruption, which you know and I know is not true. So we really always asking the Europeans, our friends in Europe, to really stand up and, 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 and apply their own laws. Uh, that is uh, uh, something really uh, we need all to campaign for, uh, etc. I was very delighted when the United States introduced the, uh, the Finance uh, Act and uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Lugar uh, Cardin Amendment, which forces all energy companies to declare their contracts. Because as you don't know if you are aware, it was a habit that major oil companies and gas companies have these massive contracts in Africa and elsewhere. And these contracts are secrets. Actually, we found out in some countries, even the finance minister doesn't know what is being paid for his country's oil or gas, when that is the main source of revenue in that country. What does it mean? It's obvious, what does it mean? Yet these great companies insist in secrecy. Fortunately, the US did the right thing and introduced that, although some oil companies, I understand, are taking SEC to court. Uh, of course, it's not them, but it is the American Petroleum Institute, which is funded by these oil companies. And uh, the main argument was that will disadvantage us in the United States, which is a very strange argument, you know. This guy's criminal, is a thief. If I'm not allowed also to be a thief, you know, then you are disadvantaging me. What kind of argument is that? Uh, anyway, there was a successful campaign in Europe, and last week the European Parliament introduced a matching resolution, a law, uh, which now takes the wind from the sails of those guys, 
we cannot win their case now because even Europe now says each company must produce country by country, project by project, project reporting. That's very important. Transparency is very important. And this takes me back to the issue of corruption. Actually, the best way to look at corruption, not through the exotic stories of, you know, this leader take a million, this guy take two millions or whatever. Let's look at the whole issue of the illicit flows of funds. That's a that, that's big issue. Actually, corruption contributes about five to six percent, only five or six percent of the total of the illicit flows of funds. So what's happening actually there? What's happening, what's the 95 percent? It's very interesting. We have about 30 percent of criminal activities, drugs and stuff like that. But then the bulk of this money actually is mispricing, tax evasion by corporations, which never pay taxes in the jurisdiction where activities took take place. And that is a big issue. Because the total amount of aid to Africa is about $30 billion a year. The amount of illicit funds is about seven or eight times this amount of money. So the question here, who is aiding whom? That is the issue we need really to, to, to discuss and we need people to be aware of these crimes which committed by our major corporation by avoiding paying their taxes where the activities took place actually. And it's very interesting to see now that UK last year, there was a big row when they discovered that Starbucks did not pay taxes or paid very little, Amazon didn't pay taxes, and all these companies have huge activities in UK and became a big issue. And uh, of course, the chief executive of Starbucks flew to you and said, okay, I'm happy to give a contribution, uh, a gift to the Inland Revenue of 10 million pounds as a gift. I mean, excuse me, what, what does it mean giving a gift? Just pay your taxes. <laughs> Why give gifts? Uh, but it's a very interesting, it is difficult times, as you understand, in UK. We are almost bankrupt there. And uh, so when you are bankrupt, you start to go through your old books to see where you can get, and then they discover this issue. And we said, hello, we had this problem all these years, and you guys never cared about it. Now we understand it's a big issue. That's something really need uh, uh, to do something with it. I read in a recent article in Herald Tribune that, uh, was it Larry Sommers, I think, uh, mentioned that the American companies are sitting in something like $2 trillion in the offshore tax havens. This money is never brought here to invest because they don't pay tax. Because it, and this is the whole issue. This $2 trillion, where they were made, they were made in our countries. They never paid tax on it, and they s moved the money to the offshore, sitting there. They're not producing jobs here in US. They're not producing jobs in Africa, etc. What is this? That raises a whole issue about world governance and governance in business. And it's time for us to ask, really, what is, when you are a director of a board of a company, there's something called fiduciary duty. What exactly fiduciary duty? Somebody need to really look at the definition of fiduciary duty. What's your responsibility as a director of a big company? You remember the collapse of the financial sector in 2008. And who is responsible? All those directors on the board of these great financial institutions, companies, etc. When they looked at their accounts, their report, etc., how they acted, what they do, what's the responsibility? I asked one board member of one of the big banks, which had major problem, 
I said, look, I mean, this subprime stuff and all these things, how you guys behaved about it? How do you dealt with this? He said, actually, our chief executive came and first time said, oh, well, we, I think we're exposed by about 10 billion. Then the next meeting, he said, oh, I think actually it is 60 billion. The third meeting, he said, I really don't know. <laughs> and I said, that's happening at this grand, amazing financial institutions. And nobody's standing up and said, excuse me, you know, blow the whistle, there's something wrong here, guys. At the same thing, at the same time, I asked him, I said, what is your position on this? He said, you, I said, you know what? These issues are so complex, we really don't understand them. If you don't understand this and you are a board member, what is your fiduciary duty actually? Should you stand up and say, please explain to me, I don't understand? Or you say, okay, I'm, I'm resigning, I don't fit to be here because I don't understand these issues. So there is, there is really a serious conversation we, we, we need to really indulge in the, uh, to talk about the, uh, governance in the private sector. It is not acceptable what's going on there and it's time to really address that. And the problems have reduced. The number of people lost jobs, the collapse of the economies of some countries is a huge price to pay for that incompetence and that uh, 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 lack of governance in our financial uh, sector. And it's just not acceptable. And what have we done with this? We still have people around who are too big to fail. Yes. You remember big, too big to fail? Then we forgot about that conversation and we moved on. I still we have those guys too big uh, to fail. When the regulator here find HSBC one and a half billion dollars or something uh, recently last month for money laundering, which continued for 10 years, it's a very interesting. Uh, <laughs> part of when you read what happened there, they said they have issued no less than 35 warnings <coughs> to the bank about money, money laundering, yet nothing happened, continued. Uh, and then we will produce a fine then, but we need to make sure it doesn't hurt the bank. So you ask the question, what does it take to withdraw the license of a bank? What you need to do? You launder money, you, 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 you indulge in all these uh, uh, criminal activities, and still we cannot touch your license because, you know, we don't want to ha hurt the economy or, uh, uh, or the, I think we need really to revise uh, a lot of issues. It's a problem for all of us, and we suffer from it in, in, in our countries because, as I said, we don't receive the tax returns which are due to us and we suffer the consequence of what happened. And I think it is also immoral in a capitalist society when we see companies, which are the pillar of the capitalist societies, introduce a new mode of capitalism where we privatize profit and we socialize loss. So, you know, I mean, is that capitalism? I make a profit, I take it home. If I lose money, then you, you taxpayers pay it. This is not capitalism, I think. So there's an issue there. So in humanity, I think we have, we share a lot of uh, uh, issues together. And I'll stop here to allow you to uh, grill me and ask some questions as well. Thank you.